Thanks. Okay, we're going to call the meeting to order. It is 7 o'clock. And this is the regular meeting of the Caneland Board of Education. We would like to inform all board meeting attendees that this meeting is being live streamed and archived for access at any time by our community members on the internet within 24 to 48 hours of the meeting's conclusion. This meeting is open to the public in accordance with guidance issued by the Office of the Governor of Illinois, the Illinois Department of Public Health, and the Illinois State Board of Education. Individuals are required to wear an approved face covering properly over their nose and mouth at all times while in the building, including during the meeting and at the microphone. If we look out and we see that there are people not wearing their mask properly, we'll take a five minute recess to let everybody reset. And if it continues, then we will adjourn the meeting and we will reconvene later um, at a later date online. So if we could please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. And a roll call when you're ready, please. Mrs. Witt. Here. Mr. Gonzalez. Here. Mrs. Junk. Here. Dr. Lawler. Here. Mr. Mankiewski. Here. Mrs. Simmons. Here. And Mr. Carey is absent. Okay, with six members present, we do have a quorum. Do any board members want to move anything from the consent agenda to new business? Anyone? Okay, seeing none, we will move on to the approval of the agenda. Tonight's agenda is, pre is as presented, so we're, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda as presented. So moved. <clears throat> Second. <clears throat> and a roll call when you're ready, please. Mr. Gonzalez. Aye. Mrs. Junk. Aye. Dr. Lawler. Aye. Mr. Mankiewski. Aye. Mrs. Simmons. Aye. Mrs. Witt. Aye. Motion carries 6 0. Move on to the board and superintendent salutes. Dr. Yes, Layden. Thank you. Um, as I shared at the last meeting, uh, Dr. Atkins and the HR department are organizing all of our uh, new staff to be introduced over a series of meetings. Uh, due to the timing and the nature of uh, schedules, that will start at the next meeting. So at our next board meeting on October 13th, we will have our new staff from uh, Caneland High School. And then over the subsequent five or six meetings after that, we'll have respective new staff from each of those buildings. So um, that's uh, an update on future salutes. And then just the other salutes, again, just to uh, share a note of appreciation and thanks for our, uh, our teachers, our staff, um, bus drivers, food service, administrators, board members, our parents, students, and families. Um, ongoing dedication to trying to make this uh, the best experience students and families can in a challenging time. So we just uh, continue to uh, appreciate the ongoing support um, from our community and we'll continue to move forward as we get new guidance and make new decisions. So that is our uh, kind of a standing salute until we finish with COVID. So thank you. Thanks to everyone. Dr. Fuchs, any salutes from you? Not this okay. evening, thank you. Okay. This is the first opportunity for public comment at the meeting. There are always two opportunities for public comments, one at the beginning of the meeting and one at the end. The board values public input to inform our decision making and to provide information and insight into what is happening throughout the district. Board meetings are held to conduct the business of the Board of Education and are required by law to take place in public. However, they are not public forums. We use the public comment section as an opportunity to listen to our stakeholders. For that reason, the board does not enter into a debate or respond to questions spontaneously or without proper investigation and deliberation. In most cases, concerns or questions requiring follow-up will be referred to the superintendent. If you choose to speak publicly, we ask that you do so at the microphone, state your name in the village of residence or your association with us for the record, and limit your comments to three minutes or less so that all who wish to speak may have that opportunity. And tonight we do have a very full lineup, so we're gonna be very strict about the three minute, three minute time limit. Once the three minutes is up, you'll have 10 seconds to wrap it up and then the mic will be cut off. Because as it is, we're gonna have people from the first list that are gonna be pushed to the second list. Public comment is a maximum of 30 minutes with a 20 minute total length of time for any one subject. Normally, I'm gonna waive the 20 minute length of time for any one subject so that we get as many people in as we can. Um, 
We ask that you not yield your time to others because it displaces other people in, in the line. You're encouraged to seek a private appointment to discuss matters concerning individual students or staff members. While public education can be an emotional issue, and understandably so, the board strives to maintain a certain level of decorum at the meeting. Those who speak are expected to maintain a tone of courtesy and civility. And so I will now call the first speaker, who is Estella Bosk, and I believe that's one that Dr. Layden received via email. Yes, thank you. Uh, good evening, school board member and administration. I'm submitting this public comment to be read during tonight's uh, board meeting in support of the mask mandate, ensuring a safe environment for my children. Last year was not easy for us, but it was the best option given their health and for my live-in parents who were also immunocompromised. We are a strong family-based community and we all care about our children. Understandably, emotions are high, but they are leading our community into one that is unwelcoming and, un and unsafe. I've held off in attending board meetings due to the anger that a simple mask has created. I feel that those that have attended indicating they are representing the vast majority are inaccurate. There is a very large population in support of masks. Masks should be part of the dress code policy. During a press release on September 24, 2021, the CDC released three studies in the morbidity and morality, uh, mortality weekly report. That highlights the importance of using layered prevention strategies, including, including universal masking to stop the spread and minimize disruptions to school operations. These studies found that school districts with universal masking policy in place were more likely um, to limit COVID-19 outbreaks. Nationwide, counties without masking uh, requirements saw the number of pediatric COVID-19 cases increase nearly twice as quickly during the same period. Please continue to follow the CDC's recommendations to keep my children safe at school. The health of all students is not and not should be based on opinions of those that don't hold medical degrees along the line of those that are epidemiologists. Neither dentists nor chiropractors have the knowledge needed in these fields. I also ask you to provide this panel on a stage with a safe environment. The yelling, anger, insults, and racial comments um, need to be addressed and stopped. We are grown adults that should show our children the respectful way to speak to others. Let's just be a kind human, publicly, privately, and personally. Our children are watching us. Overall, the students and parents would much rather wear a mask than go to full remote. Let's keep school open by simply wearing a mask. Estella. Thank you for reading that, Dr. Layden. Um, the next speaker is Tonya Grossinger. Tonya from Maple Park. I have to actually say that I'm really happy to see so many people here. Even if that means we don't all see eye to eye, it's nice that we're all getting engaged and involved. I'd like to address though, again, that I have not ever said nor will ever say that I speak on behalf of the entire Caneland community. That seems to be a trend happening that I and a couple others say that we speak. We don't, we speak on behalf of the group that we have created on Facebook, which everybody, can you please show of hands who's here from that group? So it's quite a few people and other community members that may not be on that group that have reached out to us. So I do not now nor ever will I say that I speak on behalf of the entire Caneland community. The next thing that I wanna make perfectly clear, it's been said to me multiple times throughout the last week and a half though, that um, people from the group that we've created have made a um, human chain after some of the meetings that board members have had to push their way through to get out. I don't know what board meeting that was. I've only ever missed one, maybe two since February. I'd really love to know because I don't wanna be a part of a group like that and I don't want people a part of a group that do that. Lastly, I want to um, address the passive learning. ISBE came out with a requirement that said that all students need to be learning somehow, right, during quarantine, whether they're close contact or they're, one, they're the ones that are infected. According to an article from the King County Chronicle, 
and I quote, the remote learning requires quarantining students have five hours of combination of instruction and schoolwork with a strong recommendation that districts strive to provide their students with at least two and a half hours of synchronous learning with real-time instruction and interaction between students and their teachers, according to the ISBE document. Many local districts do not offer the recommended real-time instruction, nevertheless are in compliance with the state requirements for the remote plans. Again, that was straight from the King County Chronicle. But let me ask you this, why is it that we can follow every other recommendation to a T, right? We can't come back to school at less than six feet until they say we can because it's recommended that we stay six feet. It's recommended that students at a certain grade level at a certain school wear a mask for 28 days on top of the already 14 they did outside at recess because it's recommended. Yet it's also recommended that our kids get provided synchronous learning where they can ask teachers questions, participate with their classes if they're quarantined for seven to 10 days, and that's not happening. Thank you for your comments. <laughs> the next speaker is Aaron Zwick. Hi, I'm Aaron, I'm Aaron Zwick. I am from Aurora, I have four kids in the district, and I'm kind of bored about talking about masks, but I do want to talk about um, homecoming. It's this week, it's exciting, um, it's exciting to be back. The, the office or the school's all decorated, the dresses have been bought, the boys are ready to play, it's exciting, and we're all excited. And it's having two high school girls, powder puff and parades, we're excited. But there's a bit of a cloud, and that comes from the no homecoming king and queen. And we're very, and I could let this go, but the kids are upset. And they wanted to be here tonight, but they're, they're all doing their festivities and getting ready for homecoming. So on behalf of the kids, my, student, my kids, and the ones that have been writing to uh, the staff, I wanted to just share that they are disappointed that we have taken the king and queen away with a royal knight. So we've gone from two kids to be honored at the court to one. And my problem is, is that it's, be, it's under the cloud of being a gender, let me, let me make sure I get this right, that they want it to be gender neutral, more inclusive. But it's kind of hard when our whole mascot in itself is a male dominated mascot. So it just seems kind of weird. And the kids want to go back to trad tradition. And what makes me mad as a parent is that they came to Merit to Dr. Merit or Ms. Ms. Maris. They came, they asked, they took a vote upon themselves. They wanted to keep the tradition. And unfortunately, that fell on death ears. So we just want you to just think that sometimes maybe the kids can have a say in what they want and how they want to see things at their school. And we just want to give them that opportunity before we just say, oh no, the adults, two or three adults have made the decision. Sorry, guys. And they didn't. It, it doesn't help them understand that they can make a change for themselves. So I just would like for at this moment to maybe think that maybe next year, maybe we could involve the kids in the decision making for things like homecoming, because they've already been through a lot. So can we maybe next year, I'm asking, I know that I've, I've emailed, the kids have emailed, hundreds, hundreds of emails have gone out, parents back here have emailed. And it didn't matter if you were a mask or no mask, or a lot of parents were upset. And a lot of kids were upset. So that's all I want to say. Just maybe next year we let the kids decide how they want to see their homecoming. That's all. Thanks. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, the next speaker is Terry Rhodes. That oh, that's yours? Yes. OK. Um, dear Dr. Layden, I have a statement that I wish uh, to be read for public comment tonight due to at Keeneland's uh, board meeting on September 27th. Um, in both the body of this email attached, I'm, because I'm unable to attend the meeting in person due to family medical reasons. Uh, thank you for your time and consideration, Terry Rhodes. My name is Terry Rhodes, my family and I live in Elburn. I have a child who attends Keeneland High School and I'm a member of the Keeneland community. The purpose of my public comment is to say thank you. Thank you to the Caneland board members for working hard to keep all of our children back to school in person. Thank you for working hard to keep all of our children safe in school in person. 
This has been accomplished by following the proven health guidelines of masking, social distancing, hand washing, testing, and quarantining. Your positive efforts do not go unnoticed. They are appreciated by the entire community, both the families of school aged children, as well as the families who do not have children in the district, but who are our friends and neighbors. By helping to keep our children safe, you are also keeping the entire community members safe. I would also like to say thank you to the nurses at Caneland. My family's personal experience with the high school nurse and her staff has been a positive one. Like all of us, they are dealing with the daily changes and new processes and procedures passed down by the public health department. And they have been handling it with professionalism, grace, and attention to detail. Their job is not easy on a good day. Add into that ever-changing pandemic, division of community, and their own underlying fear for themselves and the families, and you can easily see they have been handling the situation themselves is remarkable. Community. I've used that word several times. Webster defines, com defines community as a unified body of individuals, such as the people with common interests living in a particular area. I believe that everyone in our District 302 community has a common interest of keeping themselves and each other safe during these trying times. And I thank you for being a part of that. Terry Rhodes. Thank you for reading that. The next speaker is Kelly McCarty. Hi, I'm Kelly McCarty from Sugar Grove. I have two kids in the district, a sophomore in high school and a fifth grader at John Shields. Um, first, I'm going to say um, what I'm bringing up today is this book that sophomores are reading. Um, they didn't get to choose this book. This book was given to them besides a list that they get to choose after. So this is the book. It has a hat on the girl in the front. It says resist, and it's called internment. So internment, what is this? It's a camp. It's like an you know, example from the past, like a Nazi camp, right? So um, resist, what does that mean? To combat, to outlast, to repel, to keep out. And it promotes the author. She is Samira Ahmed. And she's promoting read to resist. So I thought we were all supposed to read to learn. So internment, the act of putting someone in a prison for political reasons or during a war. She states also in the book it's promoting her social media accounts, and those are very extreme and shows one way uh, leaning. And so when we get these books out, we are always told um, your comments on social media follows you. Well, it's for sure following her as a parent reading her comments. So she says words have power, use yours for good. I don't see any good in this book for 15 year olds to read. This is a story about dangers of hatred and bigotry and silent complexity. Also a story about faith and freedom, persistence and believing in your rights. I wrote hope into these pages and hope for every reader can find some in this book. The worst never assured. We have the power to make changes in our world. We have the power to be the change. Which, that wasn't bad. She also wrote on March 15, 2019, racism, bigotry, Islamophobia are being normalized. Please don't be silent, not on Twitter, not in your families, not in your schools, not in the workplaces, not in your communities. Speak shout, resist. The thing is, this book was based on our president, number 45. It's untrue, and I know it's a fiction book, but if it was written by our president, 44, I don't believe this book would even be entered into this for reading for our kids. So I honestly can't believe that we didn't resist as a English department to even put this in our schools and let 15-year-olds read this. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Chris Bateman.
Chris Bateman from, <clears throat> from Elburn. Um, members of the board, members of the administration, uh, I would also, like Tonya, like to clarify a couple of points for you, um, as well as for all of those in physical, which thank you all for coming tonight, and remote attendance. Number one, I also do not speak for the community as a whole. Over the past couple of weeks, I've been referred to as a bully, a hypocrite, mean, vindictive, spiteful, and a slurry of other words that I do not appreciate. I do, however, speak on behalf of myself, my family, the 300 plus members of a group that I help to lead and direct and have I've worked with for many months now, and those people that have allowed me to do that. The second thing, I'm not anti-mask. I'm wearing a mask. I wear my mask every day. I encourage my children to wear their masks, so please don't label me as such. Last week, I stood up and displayed a picture that my daughter had drawn. For some reason, that got interpreted as me being anti-mask. That's not at all what it was. That was a visual representation of how some of our students feel, and I hope that's what you guys took away from that. I did, uh, however, get a little heated and upset because I felt disrespected, and for that I do apologize. But what I'm concerned about is we're not taking this seriously enough on how the masks are actually impacting the children. They have to wear them, but it does have an impact. I asked this question of the board, what sort of information are you getting regarding this, and was told, Normally, we wait until more time has passed. Why are we waiting? Why aren't we asking the questions now? Why aren't we trying to get out in front of it instead of reacting to it? Please ask the questions, board members. This is part of your job. Number three, I'm not anti-vaccine either, okay? I got my vaccine, right? I support it. It does what it's supposed to do, but what it's not supposed to do is prevent you from getting the illness. It lessens your likelihood. It lessens your symptoms but this is not a miracle vaccine. So let's just all call it what it is. It's the flu shot for COVID. That's what it is. And that's good, that's a good thing, but that's what it is. Here's what I am, real quick. I'm anti sitting by and dealing with this situation. Things don't make sense. Make it make sense. I'm anti waiting for the unimaginative administration to make improvements to things that clearly aren't working. The quarantine learning, indoor recess, Board, why, again, aren't you asking these questions? When I asked them the response, well, when I asked why PE isn't taking place outside, I was told by an administrator that the majority of PE classes are taking place outside. My kids have not been outside for PE one time this year, not once. Finally, most importantly, I'm pro doing what is best for our kids. For that reason, I'll continue to ask questions. I'll continue to challenge anything that does not make sense. And I will beg and plead with all of you to work together and let us help you make Caneland the best school district it can be. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Jennifer Crocker. Crocker, yes. My name is Jennifer Crocker. I'm a resident of Montgomery. I have a student at McDolan, one at Harder. I've watched the live stream of each meeting this year, and after hearing the negative tone that the public comment section has taken, I felt compelled tonight to come and speak to the board. I want to make sure that you know that I continue to support the mitigations currently in place. These mitigations ensure that many students, as many students as possible can be in the building. My sixth grader was in quarantine at the beginning of September due to close contact with a student that tested positive. Passive streaming has its challenges, but we greatly appreciate that our students have this option. My daughter was able to keep up with what was going on in her classes. She was able to do a science lab, already testing a math test, as well as other important classwork without falling behind. She returned to school after a week without any issues. Quarantine may be an inconvenience, but it is temporary and necessary to prevent the spread of COVID in our schools and community. I would like to thank the admin team at Harder for listening to our concerns about spacing in the lunchroom at the beginning of the year. It took some time, but they were able to find a way to space out the students by using the stage and the hallways. With the number of positive cases at Harder this year, I'm certain this change resulted in fewer students in quarantine and likely fewer positive cases. 
Thank you for continuing to provide daily updates on the positive cases within the district. I know that this takes quite a bit of effort on the part of the admin, but it is information that is greatly appreciated. Before making any significant changes to the mitigations in the future, I would like to ask that you do more family surveys. This will provide you with a clear picture of what the Caneland families want. Please ensure that the survey responses are strictly limited to one response per guardian. Our family greatly appreciates D302's commitment to keeping our students safe. Please continue to defer to the medical professionals and scientists at the Kane County Health Department, IDPH, and the CDC for all decisions related to the medical safety of our children. Lastly, I'd like to thank the board members. The work that you do is important and we appreciate it. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Stephanie Paris. Hello, my name is Stephanie Paris and I live in Elburn and I have three children in the district. I wanted to thank you for following the recommendations of the Illinois Department of Public Health and CDC to keep our kids safe when in school. My ultimate goal as a parent, and I'm sure you as a board, is to make sure my kids have a safe place to learn in person. I feel that Caneland 302 has provided that last year with hybrid and this year with following the safety measures put in place per the IDPH guidelines. I appreciate that the administration staff um, has done this past year to pivot based on new data, research, and recommended guidance put out by our public health officials. I'm speaking today in response to some voices in our community who wish to uh, go against these guidelines and mandates. These voices do not speak for me and my family. I believe in science, continuing to follow the Illinois Dep Department of Public Health recommendations on masking, social distancing, testing, and vaccinations. Positivity rates in our community have been low because of these mitigations that have been uh, put in place. They work. If these mitigations are removed um, without the recommendation of public health officials um, for students, faculty, and staff, I'll be afraid for the safety of my three children, one of which is medically complex and requires continued follow-up care at Lori Children's. With the Delta variant infected, affecting more kids any change in the availability of care such as ER wait times or ICU bed availability directly affects my child. He's vaccinated upon the recommendation of his care team, so his risk for COVID is low, but I don't ever want to face that nightmare of a bed not being available for him if, um, if he needs it or if any of my family members need it. The state of Illinois, for all it may have done wrong in other areas, has gotten it right as far as COVID, COVID medical um, go, go in keeping our community safe. I'm asking the board to continue to listen to the scientists, doctors, and public health officials to keep our kids safe and in school. Masks work, vac vaccines work. Let's continue to work together to keep our kids safe and in school. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Sandy Lopez. Can you hear me? <laughs> Hello, my name is Sandy Lopez and I reside in Sugar Grove. I have two students at Canela High School and I'm here again because I wanted to make sure the voices of those in favor of masking and protecting our children during the pandemic can be heard. As I said at a previous meeting, COVID has personally affected my family. My daughter, my aunt, and two of my nephews have had COVID. Since I last spoke, three of my nieces and my nephew's newborn have gotten COVID. The threat is real. People are getting sick and some are fortunate to have minimal symptoms, but some like my aunt are not so fortunate and are no longer with us. The other reason I'm here today is to thank the board for their time and dedication to our school district and to our children's safety. I also want to note that while we are here at the school board meetings discussing educational plans for our children and their well-being, we need to treat each other with kindness and respect. Our children are watching. 
<clears throat> and while today I have not witnessed the shouting of insults in past meetings, I again remind everyone in attendance that we should be setting the positive example for our children, our schools, and our community. There is so much divisiveness regarding the virus and the use of masks. We should all be able to agree that COVID is real and it is infecting and killing people. Masks do not interfere with oxygen carrying capacity. They do not elevate CO2 levels. They do not inhibit lung development. Okay, we should be viewing masks as, as life-saving medical supplies that they are. We should not be divided on protecting our children against a deadly virus. In a time of so much fear and uncertainty, I applaud the decision made by the superintendent to follow the guidelines set forth by the governor. We know our children want to be in school. Why not be united on a mask policy and other tools that help, kid, help our kids continue their school year in a face-to-face -face setting and not force us to hybrid or to an all-virtual school year? We have five tools that we can use to keep our kids safe in schools. Vaccines, masks, ventilation, testing, and distancing. Not everyone is open to using what we know can prevent the infection and the spread of the virus. But why not use as many as we can to keep our, children's, our children safe and in school? I urge the Caneland community to put aside our differences and unite under the common goal, which is the safety and well-being of our children. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Lisa Tingler. Hi, my name is Dr. Lisa Tingler and I live in Elburn. First, I wanna start off by thanking the school district and the school board by following the advice of the state and county health departments when it comes to mitigations being taken towards COVID-19. You have allowed children like mine to attend school in person with their peers, even though they are coming from an immunocompromised family. For that, we are appreciative. The precautions you have taken during the school day have protected many children from getting sick. I would also like to thank all the teachers, school nurses, lunch monitors, bus drivers, janitors, and the rest of the Caneland staff for making every effort to make sure these kids are remaining as healthy as possible. I would also like to thank you for the addition of SHIELD testing this year. I want to encourage all parents to sign up for SHIELD testing and same with the staff. I would like you to urge, or I would like to urge you um, to stop the spread of misinformation being told and said during these school board meetings. This false information could be dangerous. Please stop giving this misinformation on a pandemic a platform. I hope the school board and district do not listen to any of this when making their decisions and only take their recommendations from the CDC and local health departments and keep their personal feelings out of it. Along the same lines, I would like to stop the negativity during these board meetings. It is very worrisome. It is also the reason many people do not attend school board meetings, along with the fact that people don't wear their masks properly and tend to have them below their nose. The anger towards Principal McCoy last meeting was completely uncalled for. Her decision was made based with the health department and with the backing of the district. She would never make a decision that would put children in harm. By allowing this anger, I fear teachers, administrators, and other staff members in school will find it even more difficult to make hard, unpopular health decisions and the best interest of everyone, knowing that they will be called out by parents and knocked back by the administration. I just want to thank you very much for letting me talk, and I want to let you know that um, I do stand by myself with all of this. They have said before they stand and speak for everybody, and they really don't. There are a bunch of us who um, they don't speak for, and we need to be heard too. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. We have time for one more speaker, and that is Scott Stalkup. Hi, I'm Scott Stalkup. I have three kids in the district, uh, one in the middle school and two in the elementary. And my questions are around the sex education and that curriculum. 
and I'll forward out some questions on this uh, later tonight or tomorrow. But I'm really curious what the district's plan on this is. Are they opting in or opting out? What is going to be the curriculum? And when is it being implemented? And what timing is certain things happening? <clears throat> Excuse me, I hear a lot of speculation that things are already being implemented, um, which worries me. Um, I think at a minimum we should, as parents, gather information. The school board should uh, give us the information, what they're planning to teach, what they're planning to give our kids in materials, et cetera. I, I think we have that right as parents. Um, as many have said, that um, I want to commend you because you have a tiresome, thankless job. And as I've said prior, I, I pray for you guys, and I still do. Um, strength, perseverance, wisdom, and grace to everybody. So um, with that, I'll, I'll op, make the same offer I did last meeting. If there's something I can pray for, please let me know. And regardless of which side you're on, it really, we are a community. We want the best. And everybody has to make their own decision and should have that right to make their own decision what's best. No different than you do for many other things. So I guess that would be my, my ploy and plead to both sides is whether you're for a mask or not against a mask, <clears throat> for vaccine, against vaccine, you should have an open mind and you should respect the discussion, conversation, and keep it factual. You should find the information, gather the information, not speculate on the information. And even if you get the CDC or the Illinois Health Department, you should fact check that. You should verify it. Make sure that they are doing what is in accordance with the law, not that they're just following what is is mandating, which there's a lot of speculation around that. Whether you're up here, Southern Illinois, wherever, you should fact check it, ask the questions, ask the hard questions, and convey that so everybody's aware. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. That concludes the first public comment section. There are about six speakers that are on this list and at least one person on the other list. You can still sign up on the other list that's out at the sign up table. Um, and that will, um, that public comment section will happen after new business and a, and a couple of other reports. So at this time, um, we'll move on. The consent agenda tonight includes the following action items. The approval of accounts payable and payroll for September 2021. The approval of minutes from the August 20th, August 30th, 2021 regular meeting. The approval of resignations, terminations, and employment of staff. The approval of 2020-2021 administration and teacher salary and benefits report and the approval of a change order and it also includes the following information items the freedom of information act or for a report and student suspension data report at this time i'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented so moved second a roll call please mrs junk aye Dr. Lawler? Aye. Mr. Mankiewicz? Aye. Mrs. Simmons? Aye. Mrs. Witt? Aye. Mr. Gonzalez? Aye. Motion carries 6 0. We'll move on now to new business, and the first item is the Kalen District Passive Live Streaming Protocols update. Yes, thank you, uh, President Witt. Um, I know Dr. Atkins will be getting into presentation position here. Um, and uh, at the last board meeting, one of the topics for future agenda was to provide an update based on a board request and uh, consensus of the board to get an update. So over the last um, couple weeks, uh, the administrative team and cabinet has worked hard to put some information together to be able to inform the board and also to use as a resource for uh, future questions. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Atkins and you can share an update on our passive live streaming. Thank you. So um, I have a presentation here for you. And at the end of it, we felt it best to provide some frequently asked questions. Um, and some information in that format so that 
um, either as the board or potentially as a community member, if I'm thinking I have a certain question about live streaming, I can more easily find that answer. Um, so as you know, <clears throat> back over the summer, the state issued guidance that our students would be returning to in-person instruction five days a week, um, but recognized clearly that there would be times where students would be excluded due to either um, positivity, symptomology, or close contact status. So they requested that we provide remote instruction. Um, and we put some of that uh, language up here. And initially when it first came out, it provided that requirement for unvaccinated students or students who are ineligible to receive the vaccination and subject to quarantine. Um, so <clears throat> some of the challenges that came up as we brought forward um, our plans with regard to what the state had asked us to do is that it did not elaborate clearly on what they called remote instruction. They did initially limit that requirement, like we said, but then they later on expanded that to include vaccinated students who were subject to um, exclusion as well. Um, in addition to that requirement, though, prior to the state adding in um, the eligibility for vaccinated students who were subject to exclusion, Caneland did put forward a plan to allow any student who was excluded the opportunity to pass a live stream. Um, and with regards to that state guidance, they did leave the specifics of it up to the local level. So with regard to passive live streaming, probably one of the most frequently asked questions is what exactly is live streaming? First and foremost, live streaming is meant to supplement the child's learning while they're excluded, not supplant direct instruction. It does not take the place of being present in school. It cannot. Um, but it is designed to supplement that time. So <clears throat> students are able to live stream in. They are able to watch and listen to the direct instruction of the, the going on in the classroom. Um, if you could think of that in terms of like a TED talk, you may want to learn more about a topic. So you go to YouTube, you watch a video. You may not be able to interact with the presenter, but nonetheless, you're able to learn large amounts of information from that. Um, the video should show the direct instructing, sh instruction that's occurring. So as the teacher is maybe reading from a big book, the video should be of the teacher with that big book. As a teacher is diagramming a 3D figure and how to find volume on a board, the students should be able to see that direct instruction being delivered. They should be able to hear what this teacher is saying in the classroom. Um, <clears throat> it is conducive to some types of direct instruction, of course, but inversely, it's also not conducive to other types of instruction. So if I'm proctoring an exam for that day, that's hard to live stream into. If I'm physically conducting a lab experiment, not the lab that I demonstrated, but now the, child's the student's turn to, to take that lab and work with it, that might be something relegated to the child's return to school after exclusion. So again, just that reminder, it is meant and designed to be a supplement to the learning, not, a sub, not supplanting the learning. What it's not, sometimes it helps to see both sides of the coin. Um, as I've said, it's not a replacement for full-time instruction. It's not an immersive experience. They're behind a screen at home. It's not a standalone learning opportunity. It's designed to be done in conjunction with some of those traditional components that we provide when students are absent for long periods of time. Again, it's not that sole methodology of continuing learning. And it's also not a requirement for students to be physically on that device for five hours a day. We have had uh, many comments over the last 20 months now about the challenges of being in front of a screen for extended periods of time for our students. So it's meant again to supplement that learning and be part of that learning, but it is not a complete replacement for being in the classroom. Parents can sign up for passive live streaming <clears throat> once their child's been identified as needing to be excluded, whether again that be because of symptomology, positive status or close contact. The building secretary sends an email. In that email is a Google link for this form. Families would complete the form, comes back to the school administration, which then notifies the teachers, hey, these, this student is gonna be live streaming in for these classes. Teachers have 24 hours to set up that passive live streaming opportunity. And then it's for any student that's in need of a device or a hotspot or technology support, please contact your building principal. We do have a supply of hotspots available for students 
to utilize to access. So if they're in a remote area or they have spotty internet connection or no internet connection at all, we have the means by which to provide that support to them. Same thing with the device. You happen to not have the proper device, your device is broken, please contact us. We will make sure that that is available to our students. <clears throat> like we were just talking about, what if I have no device or poor connectivity? Contact us, we have the means to support your student. <clears throat> Does my student have to passively live stream each and every day? That's up to the family. That Google survey that they get, they'll be able to select courses or periods of which they want their child to live stream. Some of the feedback we got at the end of last year was that their child may not have been able to actively engage with a certain type of course or a certain um, activity, yet may needed very much so to have engaged in other activities or classes. So we left that decision up to the parents. They can choose all, some, a few of their courses to live stream into, and then whatever they sign up for, we will make sure is available to them. Um, <clears throat> does it happen every single day? Again, like we were talking before, though, there may be activities, there may be assignments, projects, or tasks that aren't conducive to passively live streaming direct instruction. So those would be things that students would be able to make up when they come back from their exclusionary period. Um, if they have questions, they're encouraged to email their teachers. We do have a policy in our district of returning um, email communications in a timely fashion and students are encouraged to do that. While passively live streaming, may my student interact with the students and the teacher during their direct instruction? It's not designed for that. It's difficult to do that at times. Um, there are some times and some activities and some lessons that where that is conducive and I'm sure that there are times where students have been able to ask their teacher questions in the moment during a passive live stream. But again, that's not always feasible. So we wanna make sure that what we provide is that always feasible understanding for all of our families if their child is subject to exclusion and needs to live stream. Um, we've been asked what happens if my teacher's absent. We do provide um, Google Meet links for the substitute teacher to utilize so that your students can still interact with the direct instruction that's going on. Um, and then also they may get assignments on Canvas. They may also um, have those traditionalistic assignments and activities and projects to work on while at home. One of the challenges with um, leaving assignments for students at all levels and passive live streaming at all levels is that all of our different levels have different um, Characteristics. It may be more easy for um, a high school student to go to Canvas, see an assignment, follow along with the instructions, and self-direct their um, activity for the day, whereas a younger student might need more support with that. And so please do recognize that with a lot of these directions, they're meant for the entirety of the district, but they also may be more or less specific for different age rate span, ages and grade spans depending on those students involved. Uh, is passive live streaming the only option? No. We've always had the same prior to anything with live streaming. If your child was absent, we would have activities for them. We would have ways for them to continue their learning and engage in, in activities while they're absent. That still continues. Will my student have time to catch up after they have come back from being excluded? Yes, of course. We do not have a specific day for day calculation in our handbooks. We talk about an adequate amount of time to demonstrate your learning and to get caught up. If a student missed a test, they'll be able to retake it. Not retake it, but take it initially. If they missed a lab, they'll be able to work with their teacher and get that done. That has not changed. That won't change because of passive live streaming. Will students be marked absent if they're excluded? Yes, exclusion does qualify as a excused medical absence. Um, are there any privacy concerns with passive live streaming? No. Um, we vetted that with our council. There are no HIPAA or FERPA um, concerns with that because all those things are held um, when students come to the district anyway. Um, are other districts providing passive live streaming services? At this time, we're not aware of any that are doing that. There are some that have um, uh, staff available for what I would consider kind of office hours or guided practice. So um, what that typically looks like is students would get lessons on Canvas. They would self-pace and self-read and self-direct through those lessons, do the work, and if they had questions, there'd be a teacher available 
from 9 to 10 to answer math questions and from 11 to noon to answer social studies questions and that kind of thing. It's not direct instruction, though. What we wanted to make sure of here in Caneland is that our students had access to the direct instruction. Albeit in a passive manner, we wanted them to see the teaching. That's the bread and butter, and we wanted them to see that. Um, my student has an IEP or 504. How will they be supported while they're excluded? In addition to all those traditional practices, in addition to the passive live streaming, when students return, our special education staff will reassess our students and then adapt goals or adapt services as needed. We would do that prior to COVID. We would do that now. Does my student have to participate in passive live stream for all classes? We talked about that before, with that being a parental um, decision and a parental discussion. If you sign up for all nine periods at the middle school or for all day at the elementary school, that will be provided. Um, some of the things that we've been talking about to put in place and explore um, in the coming weeks and months, um, we did, like last year, we implemented an after-school tutoring program. Um, should we reevaluate mid-year and see that that's needed, we would be happy to bring that conversation to the board. Um, we've talked about some of those things that I mentioned other districts are doing with kind of a, a, a guided study hall support or something like that. That's an option that's out there for discussion. Um, we know that I believe the board has requested some information about how students are performing and progressing. That might then lead into whether or not some of these other options are explored and that information would be coming in the future um, if that's something that the Board of Education would like to see more of. Um, and then we are ready. I know we um, put this together and um, since then it's become a little bit less of a future consideration and more of a it's gonna start tomorrow. Um, we do have a survey that will go out when a parent um, is notified their child's being excluded and they get that email from the building secretary with the Google link in it to sign up for live streaming. They will also get a Google link to complete a survey when the live streaming um, exposure is over at the, end of the at the end of the exclusion period. So that way we can get some feedback from our families about how um, the passive live stream experience was for them and if there's any suggestions for improvement. So we do have a variety of things going on that we're watching and we're monitoring. And then hopefully with some additional feedback, we'll be able to fine tune our passive live stream experience a little bit further. Any okay. comments or questions? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Questions from board members? Yeah, Dr. Atkins. Um, yes, sir. Let me see if I, I think I understand it, but let me just double check with you to see if my thinking is right. So basically, if a student is quarantined, we treat it as if they were just absent in any other case, follow all the policies we did prior to COVID, so pre-COVID, and now we just added one more layer. We've added that passive streaming as another resource, but it's still treated just like if they've always been absent in the past. They make up work, they get contact with their teacher, those kinds of things. Is that, is that a fair? That's fair. Okay. Anything I'm getting wrong in that? I don't believe so. Okay. Uh, just a quick question for mine. Um, when, just so parents know, what's the easiest way for, like if they do want to request traditional homework, or do you want them emailing each of the teachers, or do you want them calling the school? What is the policy for parents um, to? There isn't a specific policy for that. The best thing I would tell you is to contact the classroom teacher. Okay. Absolutely. Because again, I think Dr. Lawler um, had a good point there. What would we do prior to COVID? You would contact the teacher and share what you, would look, what you were looking for for your student, of course. The Google form, especially with an opt-in fashion, seems like it creates more work on everybody. Is there a reason we wouldn't go opt out or just assume that we should prep for them to be virtually in the classroom the next day? We did that based on feedback that we did get from some of our families at the end of last year that the default of come and live stream for everything wasn't well received by all of our families. And so we made it that optional choice for them. Okay. So. Good to know. Mm -hmm. To add on to that, um, when they opt in or when they first get the email, if they don't want to opt in right away, because maybe their kid is sick and they just don't want them to have to do that, can they opt in like days later or does it have to be right then and there when they get the email? No, it is not a one and done. They can opt in at any time. Good. And that's a good point. We did get feedback that, thank you for that offer, but my child's like actively sick right now. Can we change our mind later? Of course, please. Perfect. 
the the performance data that you mentioned, we, we may be seeing the grades and um, passing rates. When do you expect to have that information? Is it like, because you mentioned at the halfway point of the school year and then we'll assess if we need more resources? I'd have to defer to um, Dr. Layden a little bit about when that would come up in terms of the pacing. I do know that it's been a conversation we've had in the past with the board and that if the board would like to request that again in the future, um, we can have received that question from you guys and prepare something. Yeah. And, and not only just receiving it from the board, it could be a recommendation to the board from administration after we have um, quarter grades and then trimester grades, or if we just have any other anecdotal information that could lead to um, other, uh, other accommodations, other uh, pieces that we could put in place if we have those needs or see that those are apparent. Rather than waiting for set grade points, we could always bring that to the board earlier. Along with those academics, and forgive me if this is, I forget, I forget the order, but do we also do the social emotional stuff? Do we get data for that stuff too around that same time? Or is it a different time? I, I'm forgetting. So you could quit. Patrick, is that part of the, um, Mr. Ali, is that part of the work that you guys are currently doing right now with the uh, SIP goals and getting feedback with your student interviews? Uh, yes, we do have, uh, we've collected some initial feedback from students through the student interviews. If you remember when we were approved for behavior facilitators <clears throat> and we purchased a program called Satchel Pulse, we have issued that first iteration of um, student feedback and uh, a student diagnostic as well as the teachers doing that. So we do have that um, information right now and our behavior facilitators are uh, managing and working through the different tiers on how to support those kids. So the, the raw data is in. We are now in the process of organizing it see which students fall into tier one, tier two, and tier three, but we should have that available shortly. I know um, on the spot, our behavior facilitators are very busy and they're daily interacting with students uh, and teachers in a variety of different ways. So there are some anecdotal feedback that we can provide, but that um, actual quantifiable data is in the, in the system. We're just going through it right now. Awesome, thank you. Dr. Atkins, what happens when a student, and I'm thinking more high school, uh, for example, I struggled with math all through high school, so I needed to stay after every day and ask questions. Do our students that are home for up to two weeks have the option to do that in any fashion? They have the option to communicate with their teacher and ask those questions, and those teachers will get back to them. And then when they return, we also have our, our TI programming at the high school, where students will be able to get that additional support as needed to be able to catch up and keep up. Some of the, the, the hardware, the hotspots, and the, for the people that don't necessarily have access to the, the things, you, you mentioned that we have a limited amount. Right now, it sounds like we have enough available, correct? And are people utilizing them, or? I'm gonna to turn to Dr. Fuchs, who probably has a better beat on the technology <laughs> availability. We do have enough at this point. We typically will only give them to students that um, qualify for free or reduced lunch. However, there are some certain uh, circumstances where we have allowed other students to have them. Um, for example, we have a few students that live in very rural areas That's that saying, yeah. need support, and so we help in those cases as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. If so you're a parent and you don't and you see that what you've described here is not what your student's experience is, how, okay, I understand they should contact the teacher and then progressively to the principal, et cetera, et cetera. But if you're in the middle of it and you, and you think that something is wrong and it's not happening for your child, do they call the school office? Do they? I would always encourage them to follow that traditional chain of command. Start with your teacher, then to the principal like you described, okay. and then from there. I just there. was worried that like, if, if it takes 24 hours for a teacher to get back, then they've lost a day where they could have been. You know, it, I'm, I'm talking about you opt in, you notice that it's not working the way that it should be. Mm -hmm. It seems like there should be tech support or at least some kind of well, I think somebody I, to check on it quicker than I think maybe I heard a couple of different layers there. Tech support would be something that we could work with our IT department on probably a little more expediently in terms of connectivity or problem solving of devices. If it's a issue with the live stream of the direct instruction itself, that would be where you would start with that teacher 
and then the administration. Um, I don't think it's at all inappropriate for a parent to advocate for a timely response, but just know that in the context of the day, um, what our expectation is is that 24-hour response. But that's on the outside worst case scenario. I don't know that that often is the case. Yes. Okay. Thank you. One of your comments, and it might have been on the screen, is um, they should be able to see what's being shown to the class, Correct. which um, from personal experience is very difficult unless they actually walk up to whatever camera is and show what they're holding. And granted, my experience was very early on this year. I think folks were really getting into the flow of it. Have teachers been given instruction to make sure that that camera gets to see really what's being shown? Yes, we've talked a, at length about that. We've had communication with our staff about what their, their expectations are as the instructors in that. Um, I do, I would not be, uh, I'm not surprised that early on there may have been some of those challenges. Um, but I think we have since rectified those that we're aware of. Good. Mm -hmm. So in the presentation, you also mentioned the future considerations and specifically the tutoring. Um, and it made me think of the tutoring that we implemented over the summer and right at the end of last school year. Do we know, is that a pretty successful program? And is that something we could mimic again this year? I'd have to defer to our Ed Services Department about the success of the summer program. I'm not as intimately aware of that. Mr. Raleigh, do you have, um, I know it's putting you on the spot, but do you yeah, recall so. highlights of um, not necessarily to the exact number of credits that were earned, but by and large, a higher level review from summer schools? From summer school itself, uh, through the lens of tutoring, we did, I don't know if I would have grades or numbers for you because we, we titled it something different. Sure. We did more seminar hours. Um, we did see that those were some of the uh, lesser attended or registered classes. And we ended up combining probably two or three. If we had, let's say, a, a K-1 and a 2, 3, two different groups, we've had to combine a lot of those. Yeah. Some of those we didn't get anybody to sign up for. And um, we did have a lot in more of the comprehensive programs over the summertime. And then going back to the March through May time period, it was effective. I don't have the numbers for you. I, I could find those. I know it was effective when we were looking at uh, credits earned, um, failing grades at the high school. That number decreased from the time that we started to put in um, not only tutoring, but uh, grade contracts for teachers. Um, when we changed some of the, the settings to be more in person, um, we started to see some of those grades turn around. So it was a lot, it was a combination of a lot of those things that were happening. And I know uh, Dr. Mums saw similar results at the elementary school. They had um, some larger numbers with their, uh, specifically their after school tutoring program. Yeah, that, that's perfect. I, did, I didn't really mean to put you on the spot with like giving you data points, but <laughs> I, I think. Just from the generally speaking, it sounds like there was a lot of positives from that, so then perhaps that's something we could look at as we move forward. Dr. Atkins, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like for our students with IEPs and 504s, we're not giving them any sort of additional support during that quarantine time. It's when they come back. Is that accurate? So the support would be what they have traditionally gotten through assignments and projects and tasks and such. And then also that passive live stream experience, which is newer last year and this year. Um, but then as far as like direct services and such, no, that would be made up when they return and reassessed when they return. So there's no option for, you know, in every other day or once a week even meeting with any support system? Not at this time, no. Okay. Piggybacking on that, so what did we do when a student was absent for a long period of time prior to COVID? Um, that would depend. Okay. If they were, um, I don't know what the right phrasing would be, medically incapacitated, they would qualify for a homebound tutor, which would be 10 hours of tutoring a week um, by a, a, a contracted homebound tutor, think like maybe a substitute yeah. kind of dynamic. Um, and then when they came back, we'd reassess and, and um, remediate when they returned. Um, so similar yeah. to that dynamic, 
um, if they were not medically incapacitated, if they weren't hospitalized or something like that, it would be that traditionalistic component where they have tasks and assignments and maybe packets or whatever to do while they're at home, and then the same thing when they return. The teacher would work with them, bring them back up to speed upon, they, upon their return. All of that's the same. Yeah. We've added in the passive live stream so that there is some sort of supplemental real-time component to their exclusion. Sure, sure. And so obviously there's a system then in case there is an emergency or there's something extreme beyond the normal realm of things we could, there are some solutions we could use then. Absolutely. Okay. Other questions? Okay, hearing none, this doesn't have a recommendation because it was just a requested update. So thank you for that, Dr. Atkins. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. Mr. Raleigh. Um, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Mr. Raleigh. Um, we will then move on. That also concludes new business for tonight. And we'll move on to the superintendent and board reports. Yes, thank you. I have a, a few updates. Um, number one, uh, if you recall, from over a year ago, the Board of Education adopted a resolution adopted a resolution uh, to conduct an equity audit, and we had the um, vendor, uh, uh, CEC, Consortium for Educational Change, through a grant that we received through the Dunham Fund that, that primarily funded the entire um, program through CEC. And if you recall, back in the end of the school year in May, based on that timing and recommendation from CEC, we sent out a, a survey for families, students, and uh, teachers. So now we have um, compiled that data, we've met with administration, and now as part of that plan, the next step are the focus groups. So we are in the process of right now with CEC putting together a schedule for the focus group meetings to take place both virtually and in person. So we are, again, we're putting those together. We have some that will be in the north end of the district, some in the south end of the district, some will be in the mornings after school. We're trying to make it as, as flexible as possible for all and any families that want to uh, take a part or take part in it. Uh, again, the uh, Consortium for Educational Change leaders will conduct those meetings, so they will be with uh, the vendor. They will put that information together. They'll bring it back after we conclude in October and November and then put the focus group findings with the survey findings. And then at that point, create our next steps, which will be um, action steps moving forward based on what we learned from all of those meetings. Can board members participate in and or observe those um, focus groups? Yes, I would highly recommend when you get those, get the information and the invites if you're available to right. take place in, in one of those. Um, the CEC, um, it was Arlana who you met here and Crystal are the two um, individuals we're working with in this engagement process. Um, they, they did share that they do try to keep the groups smaller. So they try to keep them between 12 and 15, that way they're, uh, create rapport faster and get mm -hmm. sure. to the deeper of it, get to deeper into the feedback they're looking for rather than just cursory um, overview. The other thing we will be looking for, and we're in the process of putting this together, as board member Junk, you talked about a, a Google form, um, how to RSVP this so that we have the right number of families coming. Sure. So um, that we have the right number of people that we don't get 40 or 50 or that we don't get two. Because if we have two, then we might have to cancel and shift right. some things. So we are in the process of putting together the calendar of the dates and times along with um, an RSVP form, whether it's a simple Google Doc or just a quick reply back. Um, we will put that together. And then again, that information will go out to our community and we'll continue to um, compile that and then into November, December, um, try to create our action plan moving forward. And is the makeup, the makeup of those focus groups going to be, um, you know, they'll try to get a rep, an equal representation from different parts of the community? Yes. For example, like some parents, but some empty nesters and some... Yes, the invite will go out to everybody and, and or will go out to as many community members as we can reach through direct email, through the KCN. And again, the goal is to um, um, split the times and the places where the events are held. That way we can have both the north end of the district and the south end of the district covered so we can um, uh, make it as accessible as possible to all of our community members. Sounds good. Great, thank you. Um, a King County Health Department call today. We have uh, good news in that the uh, positivity rates continue to go down. And as the positivity rates continue to go down, there was a, a series of questions 
of um, number one, when's the decision tree coming out? We still don't have a decision tree. We are using the decision tree from May and continuing to use the, the same consistent uh, decision making across the district. So building by building, it's consistent. Um, and then the other note, one of the things we asked them a, a number of questions um, is what, so what, what is the next steps or what are the next steps? If you recall back in the summer, there was phase four, then there was phase five. We got to phase five when we met certain criteria. Positivity rates, hospitalizations, um, available uh, beds, um, hospital beds, and community transmission rates. So as they're looking at those again, we're asking for them to look at that information and to please give it to us as soon as possible <coughs> so that we have time to um, review it, look at it, and make district plans. Because at this point, um, we're in a holding pattern with our current guidelines and guidance that we're receiving. It does shift a little bit at time to time, but once we do have um, updates or any new guidance, we will make sure we share that and communicate that to our families also. Todd, do we know what the holdup is with the decision tree? I mean. I'm sorry. Do we know what the holdup is with the decision tree? It's getting into the ear. <laughs> um, we don't know. We ask them uh, first question every Monday is, do we have the decision tree yet? And I think there are other factors that they're trying to work through um, before they, I think what they don't want to do is, with all the other guidance that's regularly changing and the uh, updates that are changing, I think they, right, wrong, or indifferent, I think they want to wait until they have as much of the information or all of the information, then give us a decision tree that will then work forever. With COVID, we haven't seen that for 19 months. So we have asked for just what do you have right now? What makes sense based on the data? What makes sense based on the guidance? Please give us that. Um, we have adjusted well. Our families have adjusted well. Um, we, we've adjusted as different information has come out. So we're asking for it, whatever is the most up to date that would make sense for um, schools and exclusionary. Um, another update. Um, if you recall, we only have one board meeting this year that's on a Wednesday. That is our next meeting due to the holiday on Monday the 11th. There is no school on Monday the 11th. So our next um, board meeting is on a Wednesday, which is October 13th. Otherwise, you know, you'll be here by yourself. And so <laughs> it's October 13th. Uh, the foundation meeting, the Keeneland Foundation had their golf outing um, last week. And I will allow that full update to be from Becky Greenlee, our executive director, because she's going to be attending a meeting coming up uh, to share some of the highlights of our grants and give a golf outing update. But that next meeting is on uh, Tuesday, October 12th. So we'll provide um, highlights after that meeting. And the second to last update, um, the LUDA conference. LUDA is our large unit district association, which is 50, I believe it's 52 of the largest districts in the state of Illinois that we're a part of. That uh, fall conference takes place next week. So uh, it's, it's a great chance to meet because it's districts like us that are larger um, with what are they dealing with um, going through COVID, what are they dealing with with learning loss, um, staffing, busing issues, just any issues that they have, uh, we're probably all realizing and living them at the same time. Um, then the last meeting, just or the next meeting, uh, just an update that the board, it's going to be a little bit of a packed meeting with uh, topics because we do have the board generated standards based grading. We do have the district SIP goals, which will give the district wide SIP goals, personal and a personalized learning update from Laura Garland, our personalized learning coordinator. So it will be a, um, a larger packed meeting. So I just want to give you that update now. Those are the updates I had. Are there any questions? Thank Dr. you. Fuchs. I don't have any tonight. Thank you. Board members? Um, Todd, I I'd, because I'm new to the board, I'd like a little more information on the equity audit, but I think I'll just send you an email because um, I don't know that uh, this is the right forum. But, um, you know, what, where were its roots? Where are we looking to go with the results when we get them? Um, things of that nature. I wasn't a part of the decision early on. So, okay. Okay. those kind of just things and topics. Right. I, do you want to go ahead? Yeah. If we can do that kind of stuff, like requests for information and the topics for future agendas. <coughs> I mean, it's not that you can't. You already told him so. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm just, are you, is the request for a 
future update? Is it just send you the resend it's, the information? I, I just want to make sure I'm seeing what the board wants and what you're looking for. Well, obviously, you guys discussed it when you initially voted on it, and yeah. I was just wondering okay. what was that discussion, you know, and what's the purpose of this audit? When we get the results, you know, what, what do we anticipate we're going to be doing with this information going forward? Stuff like that. Okay. Yeah, we will include that in the update after we meet again and as we do our future planning and updates with the board. Jennifer, I do. I have an update. I attended uh, my first um, standard-based uh, grading committee meeting, and I really appreciate, I know Dr. Mr. Riley, we put you on the spot a lot tonight. He did a phenomenal job. Um, it was obviously our first meeting, so it was more of a get to know each other, too, but he, um, getting all the information, um, all the work that's been done behind the scenes, everything that's been brought to this point, um, just all the gathered information, the data, just the work that's been done, um, the next t our timeline, our next steps, and stuff like that. Um, very excited about what comes next because standard-based grading is something that's on every parent's mind. We don't know much about it. I will sit here as board member. I did not know much when I got elected. The first thing I did was contact Mr. Riley and Dr. Mom, Dr. Mom, to get information so I can educate myself. So I'm excited to be on the committee. But what I'm more excited about is there was a parent that's a part of the committee and she had come here and spoke and that she was very, she was struggling to understand standard-based grading. Her son has an IEP, she's on that committee. And when she left that day, that left that meeting, she f was excited because she's a part of the process. So it's nice to have um, somebody that, you know, um, a parent come, like I said, she spoke, she, wants to make a difference and so and then mr riley she even contacted me and said mr riley contacted her the next day after the meeting said thank you for participating can't wait to hear more of your voice into it and so just i thank you as administration and just even the board and stuff like that following up with the parents and doing that kind of stuff like i said she's excited because her son does have an iep and he struggled and she's one of those parents that are very much of an advocate talk to the teachers and stuff like that. And like I said, Mr. Riley came right alongside of her right afterwards and even talked to her during our meeting and everything. So um, I just appreciate the work that's being done, so. Great, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we will move on to topics for future agendas. Is there anything? And maybe after the load we're gonna have next week I'll have items. Yeah. <laughs> What? I said maybe after the load we have next week or in <laughs> our next meeting. Yeah. Okay. So, um, second here. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. So, this is the second opportunity for public comment. All the same rules still apply. We're going to start where we left off on the first list, and we have a couple of names on the second list. And if there's time remaining in the 30 minute time frame, we will ask if anyone else has any comments that wasn't able to sign up. So it's 818. So the first speaker is Amanda Niederberger. Hi there, I'm Amanda Niederberger. I'm from Maple Park. I have two children in the district. I wanted to thank the district for the COVID mitigation we've had in place. We have seen a few cases and even had some contracted within our school buildings, but that number has been pretty small. We know that an unmasked COVID positive individual will likely infect possibly three people, maybe more. And in a school setting where they come into contact with so many people, it would likely be more. But let's suppose that the number would just be three. And imagine if each of the ones who had been positive so far, the last seven weeks or so, had given it to three other children. Let's imagine if those three had given it to the next three. You know, uh, by the seventh week, we would already have had maybe 500 children out sick with COVID and then countless others in quarantine. We'd either be remote by now or on our way to it. This board is here to ensure that our children have a safe, adequate education. And we know that the teachers and staff did an incredible job last year trying to navigate the remote learning, but nothing can beat the in-person classes with these great educators. So we are grateful that the masks are working. 
We're grateful that the mitigations are keeping our children in the school classrooms. I'm thankful to all of the staff in the buildings that are putting in hard work above and beyond to keep our children learning. I'm thankful to our support staff, the bus drivers, the crossing guards, the lunchroom staff and maintenance staff who are all being asked to do so much more than I'm sure their original titles probably suggested. Um, I'm incredibly grateful that the masking has worked to keep them safe too so that there are not further staff shortages. Um, I'm thankful to the board members who voted for those mitigations. And for the members who didn't, I hope you've come to see that the positive outcome maybe ought to have led you down a different decision. Please really think about how narrowly we escaped another year of this back and forth of you know, remote learning, hybrid, remote learning some more. The beginning of this school year has, without a question in my mind, been a success. Uh, we should be thankful for that as a community and we should be thankful that the masking and other mitigations has given us a very strong start. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Nicole Fleshman. Hi, my name is Nicole Fleshman. I'm a resident of Elburn and have lived in, Cain in the Caneland School District for over 16 years. I have two students currently attending Caneland High School. First of all, I would like to thank each and every one of the board members for volunteering your time to represent all families in our community, especially during these very challenging times. I'm here today because I want my voice to be heard. During the past several board meetings, I have tuned in online and watched other members of the community criticize the board and administration for enforcing the state mandated masking requirements in our schools. Unmasking children and staff in our schools during a time when the highly transmissible Delta variant is spreading would be irresponsible. Just one infected child or teacher could spread the virus to their entire class or their family. I'm here today to show my support of the board and the administration's decision to continue to follow the COVID safety guidelines of our scientific and medical experts, including the CDC, the American Academy of, Pedi of Pediatrics, the Illinois Department of Public Health, the Kane County Health Department, as these guidelines are designed to keep our kids, families, and communities safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Don Stasak. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Yes, you did pronounce it correctly. Thank you. <laughs> See, this is going to work. Mr. Raleigh, can you lower that, please? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mr. Raleigh. Thank you. So thank you in advance for your time and attention. My name is Dawn Stazak, and I work for one of our country's federally funded scientific laboratories, and I am a Sunday school teacher. That said, I want to make it clear that I'm not speaking on behalf of my laboratory, nor my church, but I'm speaking to you as a person who believes in science and the teachings of Jesus Christ as our way shower and moral compass. I also want to make it clear that I'm not here to argue or insult anyone's beliefs. In fact, I wrote this earlier this afternoon before I heard anybody else speak, but simply to express my opinion and strong belief as a person wearing those two hats and as a parent to appeal to the good judgment of our elected officials in the school board regarding the COVID-19 protocols currently in place in our district. My opportunity to have a voice today is timely because I just told my children yesterday in lesson that I don't envy them growing up in today's world because of the state of chaos and instability of the only two pillars of truth that were always something that we could count on, science and the Bible, which unfortunately seem to be no longer a standard. <laughs> It used to be that the bottom line to any medical or environmental question was because science. It used to be that the bottom line to any ethical question was because it says in the Bible. I am pro-human because I believe in doing my part to eradicate a virus that's killing humans based on science and math because the statistics prove how mask wearing and vaccinations help. I believe if Jesus were here with us now, he'd wear a mask because according to the Gospel of Mark 12:31, he said, the second is this, 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. So for the susceptible, not wearing a mask is like playing roulette with a loaded gun because you just don't know. In that respect, one of the Ten Commandments speaks directly to that issue at hand, the one that says, thou shalt not murder. Ultimately, if you know that a virus has a potential to kill someone, which we do, and you are told that wearing a mask has the potential to save someone's life, and you consciously choose not to wear that mask, then what does that say about you? The reality is, folks are saying that they would rather take the chance on killing an innocent person than wear a mask. Folks are saying that their right not to wear a mask is more important than someone's right to live. Speaking of murder, my daughter's school had an active shooter drill today. Does that bother anyone here? When I was a kid, we had tornado drills. When I became a parent, I never thought my child would have to endure an active shooter drill when the enemy is a person harming children. Now we have a virus out there harming children. And not only children, but our children's loved ones and communities. In Jesus' time, there was no America. Jesus was preaching about humanity and how we are to treat our fellow humans regardless of territorial boundaries, race, religion, politics, sex, or sexual preference. The Constitution was designed to be a fluid document. The Bible did not. Okay, your time's up and the mic's been turned off. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. The next speaker is Tiffany Sizemore. Hi, I'm Tiffany Sizemore from Elburn. Um, thanks for letting me speak this evening. I hate public speaking, so um, I just wanted to begin by saying thank you. Thank you to the school board members, the administration, the teachers, the support staff, the bus drivers, etc. You're all doing amazing with everything that has been thrown at you thus far. And so many in our community recognize it and appreciate it. As a parent of two new students in the Caneland District, one in fourth at John Stewart and one at six at Harder, I'm thankful for the district's adherence to the CDC guidelines surrounding the quarantine procedures as well as the governor's mandate. Excuse me. Um, my oldest, a cancer survivor, is a high risk. And it's nice to know that Caneland District is doing everything they can in their power to ensure all students are safe and able to attend school in person. Last year, so many of us kept our kids in remote learning, and the common goal was to get them all back in school. And by making small, impactful mitigations, we're able to do so, and everyone wins. Most importantly, the children. I go on, I just wanted to, I won't go over it because I know I talked about passive learning, but we had a really great experience with passive learning. My son was able to engage with his teachers, he had his assignments, and he actually really liked it. So kudos to you on getting that all put together. Um, I just really wanted to make sure that I'm also being fair. I do see the concerns with mask breaks for a lot of the children. Although my kids are okay, we are very empathetic to those children that are not. I think the school board really should look into making sure that they're getting adequate breaks, um, adding that into you know, the social distancing, whether it's outside or things like that. So I just wanted to make sure that that is being looked at for all of the students. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker, speaker is Katie Maxwell. Katie Maxwell and I am from Elburn. Indoctrination, segregation, discrimination. ISBE, IDPH, and Prisker are guilty of all three and are overstepping their legal authority and forcing you and many other districts to be guilty as well. It seems as though you're not asking questions, not requesting documentation, not following the Illinois Association of School Boards Code of Conduct standards and principles. You have let them strip you of your local authority and it directly affects the children of this district. The removal of the king and queen from homecomings were just ridiculous. The continued forced masking of our children violates our children's constitutional rights and religious rights and freedoms. Essentially, you are stripping our children of their identity. 
As you have heard in previous meetings, masks are unhealthy. You are allowing our children to breathe in carbon dioxide and bacteria, compromising their immune systems. I have over 50 plus studies showing that I have seen um, the ineffectiveness and negative health effects of wearing a mask. It is a medical device. Currently, you need a court order to mask, vaccinate, or test as they are forms of quarantine. Over five, and the number is rising, lawsuits have been placed on schools regarding uh, resulting in temporary restraining orders on the districts. Masks are now optional in these districts. These cases are popping up more and more. Naturally, because of these lawsuits, IDPH has recently deleted the definition of modified quarantine as they're trying to nullify due process requirements protected by the Illinois and federal constitutions. You cannot change the rules or definitions or laws to fit your narrative. The CDC, IDPH, and of course, ISBE are all guilty of this as well. Lawsuits are seeming to pop up everywhere. Thomas Renz and the American Frontline Doctors are suing the FDA for misrepresentation of the vaccine and numbers they have been providing. The CDC has several lawsuits filed against them, as does the Department of Health and Public Services. And I would imagine IDPH, although I have not confirmed that, um, I'd imagine you're also aware that September 14th, the Joint Committee on Administrative Rules unanimously, unanimously demands rules for ISBE over Pritzker's mask mandate, as they believe ISBE may, have over, may be overstepping their authority by revoking recognition of schools for not complying with the mask mandates. On ISBE's website, they have a section, um, a strategy section, and it's got the do's and don'ts about talking about the vaccine, where they tell you not to use science, and they, try, and they tell you to try to counter the vaccine myths. This is coercion. Plain and simple. ISBE is out of control. By the way, all of the schools that had been previously on probation have had their statuses changed back to fully recognized. Since we now know it really isn't about the children's well-being, why then would ISBE be putting their funds over our children? Could it be that the state received $5,054,988,054 from the American Rescue Plan Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund? Looking further into this, looks like District 302 is certainly banking some serious cash and grants as well. $1,838,000, uh, I'm sorry, $1,838,234 to be exact, if I gather my information correctly. You have about it makes sense to me. Um, you receive money, a lot of money to provide. Your mic's been turned off and your time is up. Thank you. The next speaker is Matt Delgado, I think, or Delgado. Is he here? No? Okay. The next speaker is Tanya Grossinger. So I have a couple questions. I've been told I need to make my questions clear, so here they are. I asked at the last meeting, and I have yet to receive a response, even though I've emailed and asked again, what is happening to the SHIELD testing program as of January 1st, when PCR tests are no longer allowed to be used? <clears throat> Couple of questions about the uh, passive live streaming. Can it be recorded so if kids that have working parents and need to stay you know, with grandma and grandpa uh, need to do this, they still have an opportunity to watch the live stream. Uh, why aren't we looking at grades because of like, due to this sooner rather than later? If we push it off too much, isn't that just making it much harder for these kids to come back from? Um, can the board or administration try and listen in on one of these live streams? Uh, maybe see what the kids are seeing, hear what the kids are hearing because we can hear it's all good and dandy, but that doesn't mean it's actually working for people at home. Um, it's weird to me that only extreme cases get the extra help. I would think that anybody with an IEP in general just deserves the extra help. They're at home because of something they cannot control. They're not sick. So you're just pushing them further and further behind. Um, as far as the uh, equity audit goes, like Mr. Gonzalez had stated, I have asked the question, what is the outcome, so, like what are we doing with the information once it's gathered? I have yet to receive a response from that as well. Um, let me see, sorry. 
Oh, and a couple more notes on the passive live streaming. I would like to know why it is we're not doing any of the synchronous learning like ISBE has recommended. Again, we follow every other recommendation like masking kids outside for 28 days because it's recommended. Why aren't we trying any sort of synchronous learning, especially with little kids, learning to read, all that stuff. Um, is it because we don't have the resources for it? Is it because of the MOU with the KEA that we can't do it? What is the reasoning behind it? I believe that we should be able to know that, seeing as how it's our kids that have to do this. Um, again, I'll email all these questions, hoping to get an answer, even though I emailed last time and didn't get one. Um, I appreciate your time, thanks. Thank you for your comments and we'll look forward to receiving the questions and email, thank you. Um, and the last speaker is a Christian, uh, is it Walmer? I may have, if I said that wrong, I apologize. Hello, thank you for your time. I did not have any intentions of speaking tonight, but I, this has been weighing on my mind quite often lately. Um, my question is about the shield testing. Um, I would like to know why the children are being taken out during precious education time to do these tests, which are optional from their parents. Um, I think a good strategy for spearheading a positive case would be to have said optional shield testing people who choose to do this come prior to school to be tested to not disrupt education time. Therefore, we can spearhead a positive case before they sit with their fellow students for three to four hours. Um, that's really all I have. Everything else has kind of been said and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. So there, there are a few more minutes. Are there any other public comments? Yes, Mr. Stalkup. Scott Stalkup. Mine is pretty simple, really. My question is how can we help you with? the Kane County Health Department. Should we email? Should we call? How do we help most effectively get the tree from them, information? I mean, let us help you with that. If there's some way we can do that, just let us know, please. Thank you. Are there any other public comments? Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Oh, sorry, didn't see it. This, this is, I'm gonna skip, I love the Caneland Gold Ford group, but I'm gonna skip all the masking, but I've, I've got all you guys there. I'm actually, my name's Lauren Chaya, I live in Elburn, but I'm an educator in another school district that's doing active live streaming, so, all my students that are quarantined or that are remote, I actively all day during the day instruct them. They answer questions, they raise their hand, they participate. Is it a pain? Absolutely. Does it take a ton of my time? Yes, it does. But they are actively participating in my third grade classroom all day long. Um, I'm in East Aurora, so I'm really not that far. So just to see our districts say that there's not anyone else that's doing active Remote learning, it's just not true because I do it every single day. And I have kids that do not wear masks and that's why they're at home. So I have kids that are remote since my first day of school and they are receiving the same education, although they don't get the hands-on piece, but they're receiving great education. And if they have an IEP, they are receiving their minutes from our resource teachers. They're pulled by our reading interventionist for RTI. They are pulled to be tested. They are pulled in Google Meets to receive all the services, speech. Um, they even meet with the social worker if they have SEL minutes. So it is possible, and if you really need help, you can reach out to other districts because we figured out how to do it. So I hope you can too. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. 
Are there any other public comments? Okay. Seeing none, we're going to move on. Um, tonight we do not have a closed session, so after the adjournment, um, the recording of tonight's meeting will conclude. And so I am looking now for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. Okay, and it's 839. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion